Okay, we're recording. Excellent. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so welcome to the first of the actual, say, data demonstration videos in part of this little video series. So if you've watched the previous lecture, you should have an idea of the, uh, the system that we're talking about and some of the questions we're trying to ask and answer. Um, and here for the next well, we've got six, seven videos, I'm going to talk about different, just show you the sort of the, the scripts and some of the analytical techniques that we use to, to answer some of these questions. I'll do all of this in, in OR using various packages, some that will probably be familiar to a lot of you, some that a lot of you are probably more familiar with than, than I am. Um, and we'll use most of these to sort of to, to summarize data, to plot data, and then some of the more specialized packages, things like the uh, the Simmer and Cyber and some Mixire towards the end that are really tailored specifically for stable isotope data analysis. So all of this will be done in, like I mentioned, in OR. I prefer to use OR Studio for any of the stuff I'm doing with OR. And for the last few years, I've moved most of my stuff into these OR projects and markdown files. And that's what I'm going to use here. Um, for you, those of you who are not familiar with this approach, basically, it's it's almost the same thing, but instead of sort of setting a working directory, we build the uh, the instance of OR within the, the folder that the files are in. And it allows us to keep everything in one place and saves everything to that folder. And it's a really nice and neat and tidy way of keeping keeping the analysis with all the data and the files that you're going to need and keeping everything in one place. So without further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen here and we will start looking at, um, at how we're going to do this. OK, so the first thing I want you to, to have a look at is, let me see, which screen? Let's just share this screen here. Okay, oh, there you are. There's my background music, so we get that out of the way. And so, for, for this data workshop, you will need a data input file, which is prelim.csv and the actual script file here, which is I've entitled um, demo one intro dot ormd and this ormd simply means or markdown file. Um, this we can open this up and have a quick look at it. This prelim.csv file. Very straightforward stuff. It's a um, <clears throat> CSV file with all the information we have about the, the species that we're interested in. There's quite a lot of data here and um, we've got 500, nearly 600 rows of data. Each row represents either a fish or an invertebrate that was sampled in a different lake. So here, see, we've got Lake Kivi, which is one lake in Finland. And if we scroll right the way down, I'm not going to do it right now, uh, we will reach Lake Vuontis, which is another lake. And this is where we're looking at comparison between these two lakes. In these lakes, we've got a series of different species. Some of these are grouped as a fish. Some of them are grouped as, as invertebrates. We've got a, an ID, a unique identifier code for all of these. These are two sort of grouping variables where I've grouped stuff as a, a consumer fish. Further down here, we have piscivore fish, uh, BMI for benthic macroinvertebrate. And also in here, we have a um, ZPL for zooplankton. We then look at the, another grouping variable here. We've gla classed things as, as either fish, as littoral shallow water invertebrates or profundal invertebrates based on the depth that they were recorded at. So here we've got sample depth. That's not available for fish. We're assuming that the fish are moving amongst all the depths. But then say for some of these invertebrates, we've got samples that were taken at one meter depth, two meter, three meter depth, five meter depth zero meter depth right in the shoreline, 10 meter depth, and that's below that compensation point. So that's down in the, in the deep water, in the profundal. All of these have a carbon isotope ratio associated with them and a nitrogen isotope ratio associated with them. And also we have percent C, percent N, and the elemental percent C to N ratio. So that's the ratio of percent C to percent N, which isn't related to um, the actual isotope ratios. And we'll use that in this demonstration. 
OK, so that's what the data file will look like. I'm going to go over here and open up a, an instance of OR, my OR Studio, and that's coming over here. I'm just going to reload what I had before. I'm going to bring it back over here. I'm going to close that, close that. I just want to get this nice and tidy before, our, before you guys see it. OK, so. Let's get that out of the way. Perfect. OK. So, <clears throat> so this is our studio. You type your script or your code in here. You've got the, um, the terminal windows, things like that down here. Help boxes, packages, things like that over here. And our environment up here showing us what's been loaded. This is probably familiar to, to the majority of people here at least. So what we want to do is to set this up as a as a project. OK, so to do that, once you've opened up our studio, you can go in to this button. It's slowly swiveling to see what I'm doing. This create new project box up here. And do I want to say that? Yes. It's it. So create new project in an existing directory. So simply that's wherever you've saved that file and the, the script file as well, say. So for this, for our purposes here, I navigate to anywhere in your, so I'm using a Mac, so this is my finder, but any of your little windows, um, to something I've called data demo videos. You might call this isotope data analysis, whatever it is. Just create a, um, a win or a folder, and in that folder, you should have your prelim.csv, and the uh, the markdown file. So click that, create project, da, 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 and we'll create a new project called demo one intro, data demo video. So it's called it's a new project and it's within data demo videos. And here we go. So you see now, because this is in my folder, we see we now have this folder is updated with this instance of or this or project is now in the folder and it's reading everything that's in the folder so it's reading it knows that there's prelim.csv and it knows that we have a the markdown file here so markdown files for people who are not familiar with them i'm just going to open it up here and okay so essentially a markdown file is similar to a script file but it's uh, it's designed in such a way that it allows you to annotate the text. It allows you to sort of say, add your own notes as you're going through. So you'll see, I'm not going to go through this in a great amount of detail right now, but you'll see where we've got these denoted, these little boxes that appear in, in gray text. And this is actually functioning code, functioning script. But anything that's in white here has a, it's just notes. So you can make your own notes around it. You can include links. And, and so on and so forth. So for something like this, it's really nice. And at the end, we'll see we can knit what we call knit. We can knit all this together and it'll produce a, a PDF or a Word document or a HTML file that will combine all the, all the code with all the notes, all a nice single package that can be handed out to students at a, at a workshop can will give them all the bits and pieces of their data analysis that they need to do and the notes to explain what's happening in each one of these. So where do we want to start? First, we'll start by I will start by telling you that the first thing I did this morning was updated myself to the most recent video version of OR. So I'm now on 4.0.5. Point Fingers crossed that everything worked on 4.0.3 will continue to work here. And I went in and uploaded the, made sure all the packages that I had were, were uploaded. At the start of each of these little tutorials, we'll go through what packages are going to be used. Usually I keep a, a separate block of text up here. And as I use more packages, I just add them into that. So at the start, we we'll click run and it'll load all of those. Um, OK, so for right now, we're going to just keep things quite simple. The packages we're going to install are ggplot, which is a um, plotting software, visual data visualization software, and um, two other packages called reshape2 and plier. 
which are sort of for data carpentry, say for rearranging data series and moving things about and summarizing data. And you'll notice that all of these are part, and some of you are more advanced than I am at this, are part of the tidyverse suite of packages. So if you just have tidyverse in your own tidy um, way of coding this stuff, by all means, fire ahead. This is a, uh, a tutorial to get people up and running, to be honest. OK, so the first thing we need to do is to run this. So you'll see this is one nice thing about these little blocks here. When we run the, the block, it will run. If we click to run the block, we can run this entire block. Or we can run a single line run, turn within that block just to run that one line of script. So we've got our packages are now installed or uploaded. So we can go to packages and scroll down. I'm just going to try and find one quickly. Uh, ggplot2, OK? Grammar graphics, and we've loaded that. It's now ready to go. OK, so this is some just some script or some notes, basically talking about what we're going to do here. I'm not going to read through these. Um, and a link to the, the paper that I discussed earlier. So the first thing we want to do is load our data in. So remember, we've called it our prelim.csv and then have a look at that data. We can do that either by just looking at the header or by clicking into the actual data tab here. And that'll bring it up here. So you can see we've got pretty much the exact same when we, as when we visualize that down that CSV file. OK, so what do we want to do with it? So a couple of the first things, maybe we want to just summarize this data and get an idea of generally what type of values we have. And then we're going to do some, um, some preliminary plotting just to have a look at the data and start making some inferences about what's going on in these systems before we, um, before we do any data analysis at all. So let's say the first thing, one of the things we want to do here is, oh, Let's just get over there. Okay, so let's make a summary of called data sum. And again, I'm just going to tickle that and run it. So we've created a new thing here called data sum, which is basically using the ddply and the plier function or plier package to summarize data by lake and species and give us a count. So we know what the length of each species, that's sort of how many we have the mean and standard deviation for carbon and nitrogen. So let's have a look at that. So we see kiwi species is blank, and I'm going to go in and figure out what that's all about. And we've got invertebrates. We've got some fish, things like the grayling, LSOR, which is the large sparsely rakered whitefish. So wherever we see LSOR, that means whitefish. And our means and standard deviations and you see, because it's it it doesn't know that our instrumental error doesn't go beyond one decimal place. But when you are looking at this yourself, you should always remember never report isotope data isotope data points at a higher precision than your instrument error, which is typically 0.1 per mil for, for at least for carbon and nitrogen. So let's say we just want to look at the fish. We can subset out fish, so we say subset on data for class equals fish, unless it's just going to give us the fish. Look here, fish, OK. We've gotten rid of all those pesky invertebrates, and we just have the different species of fish in the kiwi, alpine bullhead, grayling, and so on. We can do the same thing here, just to summarize this, and then plot it up to have a look at it. Fish some. So, like kiwi, We've got seven different species of fish, like Vuontus, <laughs> seven different species of fish. Yep, <laughs> seven and seven makes 14, good. Um, so we count how many individuals from each species do we have? One or two, Quite some of these are quite infrequent. Others, LSO whitefish and perch, which are the species of interest. We've got quite a few of those in, in both lakes, and then a handful of some other species as well. We see we've got our mean carbon with standard deviation, mean nitrogen with standard deviation. Typical sort of summary data sets that we make using our uh, 
using our data. Quite often it's nice, you can, if you make one of these, you can include it as a, a supplemental material in your paper and everybody else who wants your data can get your data. Okay, so let's start plotting out some of this just to have a, have a first look. And I mentioned earlier that really what we're interested in was two species, perch and whitefish, and how both their isotope ratios differ relative to each other and how they differ relative to each other in these two different lakes, one deep lake and one shallow lake. So let's have a little look. So what we've done here is we've sub 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 we've created new data, which is a subset on data where species is perch and species is LSR. And then we're going to plot that in our, our ggplot. And basically we put our aesthetics in here. We say on the x-axis we want species, y-axis is um, carbon, grouping that by, by species and coloring it by species in a box plot. And we can look at this here. I'm going to do a little zoom. It's a bit bigger. So Lake Kiwi and each of these dots is the value that we have for one single species. And if we look here in Lake Kiwi, whitefish, LSO whitefish, the red dots, and perch, the bluey dots, very, very similar carbon isotope basers between the two. However, if we look in Lake Fuentes, they're quite different, particularly the, uh, the perch here are enriched in 13C relative to, to the whitefish. So already, just by plotting some of the data, we're starting to see that there's differences, that the level of difference among these species is related to or differs between lakes. We might then want to look at this across some of the other variables. And again, here, so all we're doing, we're melting the data, data frame, so we're picking out specific variables that we're interested in and then plotting those. And again, this is all I'm doing here is just giving a, a sort of quick demonstration, some functionality around this to use these tools to, to visualize our data. Okay, so things we need to be aware of. First of all, Lake Kiwi. Carbon values, we've already seen these, they're quite similar. Perch and whitefish nitrogen isotope ratios, delta 15N nitrogen. A much bigger 15N range in the perch. Some individuals quite enriched in 15N, some other individuals very similar to, um, to whitefish in Lake Kiwi. We move over here to Lake Vuontas, very, very, whoops, you, know, you all don't need to see my emails. Eh? Um, Trust me, there's nothing interesting in there. Um, so not so much difference between the two in Lake Fuentes. We look at this elemental C to N ratio, and we can see here we've got not much difference in Lake Kiwi. In Lake Fuentes, the perch have a higher C to N ratio than the whitefish. C to N, we'll, see, we'll look at that, I'm gonna look at that in a moment. In fact, let's leave that, we'll look at that in a moment in more detail then. One of the things we might want to look at is some of the different things that could be biasing our data or identifying outliers within the data. And again, these box plots are a nice way of spotting. We've got one outlier here in C to N. Very high C to N ratio is an indication of a lot of lipid in the sample. Okay, so again, that might be something you might want to go in and just check that sample and see is there something off with it? Is there a reason that it's that has very, very high lipid content. Alternatively, we may be interested in, if we're just dealing here with fish, we're not too worried about the, the role of inorganic carbon. But if you've got invertebrates, particularly, particularly if you're working in a marine environment and you've been taking some invertebrates, you may well have gathered some inorganic carbon with that material. And remember, if we went back to some of the, the earlier lectures in the course, that inorganic carbon will have an isotope ratio that's very similar to um, the, the standard Vienna PDB. So it will draw your values towards, towards zero. So one thing you might want to do is just plot some of the data and have a look and see, is there evidence of carbonates? And by doing that, if you want to do that, one way of doing that is looking at the percent C in a sample or the, indeed the C to N ratio, relative to 13C. 
And if there's a lot of carbonate in a sample, what we'd be expecting to see here is a positive correlation that as the amount of carbon in the sample increases, we see a decrease in C to N ratio, or excuse me, in carbon isotope ratios. So although that, that the line I'm, I'm drawing here is going up, we're actually seeing values that are becoming enriched, say, in, in 13C. So again, we're dealing with fish here, white fish and perch. No reason to think that there would be a lot of inorganic carbon getting into those. We've got fish muscle plugs, basically, is what we've analyzed here. So there's no, no worry here. If you see a very strong relationship there, it's a sign that you may need to go back and acid treat some of your samples to get rid of that inorganic carbon. Another thing we might want to look at is the effect of, of lipid on the, on the data. And here, and again, we've talked about this during the course, that if you've got a high C to N ratio, that's an indication that there's lipid in the sample. Lipid is depleted in, in 13C relative to, to muscle. So depending on your research question, you may want to remove that, yeah? So here's a quick plot to have a look at that. And again, what we're expecting to see here is as the C to N ratio increases, the values become depleted in 13C, that the, the line is, is trending downwards. Because we've got more lipid in the sample, and that's influencing our, our values. Again, there's no great evidence of, of that here. Remember, what you may see, you, this may not, there may not be a lipid effect here or you may see differences in this among individuals because of uh, ch changes in feed and things like that as well. So it's not always going to be a, a direct lipid effect, but it's something you need to, to have a look for. Typically, we'll say that things with a value of C to N below 3.5 are not going to be influenced by lipids. So another option is to simply plot these out and just very quickly have a look and see, do you have individuals that are below that cutoff of 3.5 or 4? And we see here in Lake Kiwi, for the majority, there doesn't seem to be much of a lipid effect. But in Lake Vuontas, we do have some evidence of a lipid effect. Certainly a lot of individuals are above 3.5. And if we look at some of these stickleback or even some of these perch, they're even up above 4. So we definitely want to correct these values for, for lipids before we use those isotope ratios to directly understand or compare the estimate that the feeding ecology of these two different species. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. You can do that by rinsing the sample with a chloroform methanol wash to get rid of the, of the lipid and I can be more than happy to share my lab protocols around that if that would be useful. Um, but quite often I prefer to use lipid correction models because it means you can run the data and then correct post hoc. Um, there's different models for different types of tissues. Typically for uh, most of my work is in fish muscle and we've got really good models available for fish muscle. In vertebrates things, it doesn't really work quite so well. So depending on the, the tissue or the species you're interested in, correction models might work or you may have to go and do the actual uh, chemical treatment. But the, the, mod, the lipid more normalizing model I like to use, I typically use is one that's reported in Kilunan et al, and that's a link to the paper there. And essentially what you're doing is correcting the carbon isotope ratios as a based on the C to N value. So the higher the C to N value is, the bigger a correction to the carbon isotope ratio you make. And essentially these are different standards that have been developed by Kilunan et al, um, or diff different set values rather. Um, depending on what species you're looking at or what tissue you're looking at, there may be a different model that has different values and you may want to use those instead. So one nice thing, and that's I'm just going to bring back up so we can click that to run it. And essentially all we've done, we've said data, create a new column. It's a dollar symbol there called D13C core, which is now our lipid corrected D13C. And we can look at that if we bring back up our data tab. We see now 
we've got a new column called 13 uh, called d13c core in that data frame so what effect does this have on the data let's have a look so here we want to create a plot and what we're plotting here is let's just draw this up again what we're plotting here is d13c versus d13c core Right. Um, and we see that all the lines, all the points move above the one to one line. So that what essentially what that is telling us is that by running this correction equation on it, we've all the values have become enriched in 13C, which kind of makes sense. And the size of the enrichment. So here I've scaled these circles by the, the C to N value. And you'll see the C to N is so the larger the circle, the bigger the correction. So essentially, this is just visually showing us what we've done, that we put this correction into the data or onto the, the values. And it, the bigger effect it's had is on the C to N or values with a, a high samples with a high C to N rating. OK, so it's a good sign that it's worked. Again, always good. You've got these tools now. You can sort of take them, play with them, run them with your data. And it gives you always, always, always take the time before you go running mixing models and doing any of that. You spend some time looking at the data and getting familiar with your data. And that's essentially what we're doing here now. One last thing I'm going to show you is this GG pairs. And this is something, again, it's a little tip. It's not overly useful here, but for other things, it will be very, very useful. And so it's something I discovered and I'm passing it on to you. OK, so essentially what that will do after all this comes through, it will show us a pairs plot and so just scroll down to see it. Here we go. So what we're looking at here is the distribution of. So you'll see the distribution, a, a density plot of the distribution for each of the, the variables that we have. Here we're looking at the a density distribution density plot of the distribution of 13C, similar for 15N, percent C, percent N, C to N ratio. And you see that high long tail in C to N ratio. So that's some individuals with a high C to N ratio. We're also then looking at sort of a, a correlation matrix here as well. So we're looking at the correlation between D13C and D15N, you can visualize the points there. And we've got a negative correlation, that's significant, that might be interesting. Um, what else might be interesting? Let's look down here at the C to N ratio and 13C. We've got a positive correlation there. So there's, oh, excuse me, no. Uh, yes, C to N ratio on D13C, positive correlation there. And that's probably been driven a lot by some of these, uh, the, the values from that one lake, because I think the one to switch on the higher C to N ratios. Okay, so that's something that's useful, particularly if you've got multiple different things in your data set that you're, if you want to say, oh, it's 15N and 13C correlated with uh, fish length, yeah, or the density of fish in a lake or whatever. That's a, a quick and easy tool to sort of visualize that. I wouldn't expect to see a lot of correlation between 13C and 15N and things like that here, but it's always nice to know. OK, so we've had a first look at the data. We've. Or should be now somewhat familiar with some of the tools and packages we're going to use. The next little video I'm going to do is generating a stable isotope byplot. So the next thing I'm going to do is actually bring back up my team. All right, I'm going to stop recording. OK, you can see me now. OK, yeah, so that's our our first little video. The next video, we're going to look at making some um, stabilized our by plots and sort of making some initial data inferences from those by plots. OK, so I'll see you back here in a little while and we'll do that. All right.